Aaron will come to order, please. Invite our uh, guest to uh, take a seat. Senator Capito and I are delighted to be with all of you. Martin, good morning. Well, good morning. Today, uh, we're privileged to examine an important piece of a bipartisan legislation, conservation legislation, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. We're fortunate today to have an esteemed panel of witnesses before us, Dan Ash, Economist Sarah Parker Polly, and Jonathan Wood. And we thank all of you for joining us here today. We'll also hear from uh, two of our colleagues, Senator Lorna Heinrich and Roy Blood Martin. Welcome. Roy, welcome. Prime sponsors of, of this bill. And uh, we're pleased to, to welcome each of you. This morning, we thank you for joining us and for your passionate leadership on, on this important issue. Our committee has uh, enjoined a, enjoyed a, uh, an enviable bipartisan track record of enacting wildlife conservation legislation over the past several years, such as the Wild Act and the ACE Act. We hope that uh, this hearing will jumpstart a discussion to build on that bipartisan record of success. A recent report by the United Nations shows that nearly one million species may be pushed to the brink of extinction in the years ahead. One million. That alarming number should serve as a dire warning for all of us to do our part to protect our planet and all of God's creations that inhabit it with us. Biodiversity loss threatens our economy, threatens our uh, ecosystems, threatens our health. And that's why the Recovering America's Wildlife Act is needed and why I'm grateful, why we're grateful to our colleagues and our friends who put so much effort into developing this piece of legislation. Uh, we are looking forward, uh, and in fact, I think we're eager to, to work uh, with you on improving this legislation. Recovering America's uh, Wildlife Act aims to provide much needed resources for wildlife conservation and recovery. With that in mind, that need in mind, uh, this legislation would also provide uh, billions of dollars to state and, and states and to tribes for those purposes. As a recovering governor, I understand that states play a leading role in uh, wildlife conservation across our country. And in recent decades, uh, my home state, the first state, Delaware, uh, which, um, what was yesterday, the seventh, I guess it was the seventh, uh, was, I think it was, I want to say 234 years ago yesterday, that while Delaware became the first state to ratify the Constitution. So it's been it's a big week for us in Delaware. In recent uh, decades, our, our home state, the first state, has made great strides in recovering species like the horseshoe crab, the Delmarva fox squirrel, the red knot, and the piping plover. And a uh, few people understand this better than one of our uh, witnesses today, Colin Ma, who is our former Secretary of the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. Strong, a warm welcome, Colin. That uh, success in Delaware has made, was made possible by working side by side with the Fish and Wildlife Service and other partners. Concern that some have raised with Recovering America's Wildlife Act as a draft is that it may not sufficiently support this important teamwork, but we'll get into that later. In a, a, a recent uh, visit to Prime Hook, uh, National Wildlife Refuge in the southern part of our state. I learned that the northeast region of the Fish and Wildlife Service is spearheading an effort amongst, I think, 10 states, including Delaware, to prevent the salt marsh sparrow from reaching the brink of extinction. In addition to playing this important coordinating role for proactive wildlife conservation, the Fish and Wildlife Service leads efforts for recovering our nation's threatened and endangered species. That's the kind of critical work done by federal agencies that needs our support. And I hope to find a way forward for this legislation to do just that. Let's keep in mind that private landowners also play a central role in species conservation and species recovery. And we need to ensure that the Recovering America's Wildlife Act properly recognizes and supports their contributions as well. Our committee has spent a considerable amount of time over the last several years uh, hearing from numerous experts from all across the country about wildlife management and the challenges that, uh, that, that it faces. One common theme emerged from all those hearings and conversations, and here it is. All of the entities involved in wildlife conservation need increased financial resources to be successful, all. So while we should absolutely address the funding needs of our states and tribes, we cannot afford to ignore the legitimate needs of our federal agencies and other partners. Lastly, 
uh, as our committee contemplates all of these funding needs, we should also contemplate uh, funding sources. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act proposes nearly $14 billion in investment and has drafted the legislation identifies a funding source that may not be reliable or fully pay for the bill's spending. As our colleagues have oftentimes heard me say, things that are worth having are worth paying for. And this wildlife funding legislation is definitely worth having and worth paying for. Again, we look forward to hearing from our colleagues and our witnesses today, and we look forward to working together toward our common goal of recovering America's wildlife. And with that, I'm uh, privileged to turn to our ranking member, Senator Capito, for any comments that she'd like to make. Senator Capito. Thank you, Senator Carper, for calling today's hearing. I want to thank Senators Heinrich and Blunt for attending along with our witnesses, and I look forward to hearing from each of you. I appreciate that the Association of Zoos and Aquariums is represented today. Just recently, I toured the uh, Ogilvy Good Zoo uh, in Wheeling, West Virginia, which is accredited by the AZA. Uh, the Good Zoo houses 20 species. I didn't realize this until I actually uh, saw it with my own eyes. Uh, the Good Zoo houses 20 species that are deemed rare or endangered, and its staff is doing valuable work on research to inform conservation of these animals. Speaking of zoos here in Washington, the administration, and did you get that? Okay. The administration and Congress should pursue bipartisan policies to preserve our nation's public lands, wildlife, and ecosystems. Our environment, our natural resources, and access for sportsmen are legacies we've been entrusted with safeguarding for future generations of Americans. So today's hearing is focused on the legislation that has inter been introduced by Senators Heinrich and Blump, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, and I thank them for their advocacy. The bill has support from both, broad support from both sides of the aisle, as well as, support, as well as support from the stakeholder community, including hunters and anglers, conservation organizations, and industry. I'm eager to learn more about the legislation through today's hearing. As I understand it, the goal of Recovering America's Wildlife Act is to provide funding to states to cover, out, to cover conservation efforts that will recover species, as well as prevent listing additional species under the Endangered Species Act. As part of this discussion today, I want to emphasize for me the importance of state-driven conservation. Conservation is most effective when led by state and local entities in cooperation with voluntary efforts by private landowners. These are the people that know their habitats, their communities, and their local economies the best. Recovering America's Wildlife Act provides each state the flexibility to tailor their conservation strategies to meet its specific needs. West Virginia is home to 1,233 species of greatest conservation need. I don't know if I'm included in one of those, but uh, I might be. With state-driven efforts, the unique needs of each of these species can be addressed through conservation efforts that will help recover declining populations. As I do when I evaluate legislation under consideration by this committee, my focus will continue to be providing states with the flexibility to address their unique needs and circumstances. As introduced, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act relies on revenue collected from environmental-related violations and enforcement actions to help address its cost. As I understand it, the bill will result in $14 billion in direct mandatory spending over a 10-year period. I think this is an issue, that, and Senator Carper mentioned this, that we need to consider against the background of the growth of our debt and deficit during this pandemic and in light of the $4 trillion package that has been recently uh, introduced and is under consideration. We also need to consider how effective any new conservation efforts will be if the administration continues to pursue its rollback of sensible ESA regulations, which may serve to actually undermine investments in conservation. In particular, I'm deeply concerned with Fish and Wildlife's revisiting of changes needed uh, to, made to the implementation of uh, ESA under the previous administration. These rollbacks will set us back in achieving our conservation goals by increasing costs and burdens of doing the right thing. Specifically, the decision to rescind the 2020 regulation defining the term habitat for purposes of designating critical habitat under ESA. Leaving habitat undefined creates uncertainty for private landowners on whom species recovery absolutely depends. In any discussion of conservation, I think it's important to address common sense reforms for ESA. Cooperation with states and landowners is key for species recovery. Under the ESA, we should ensure that we balance the interests of Americans and their livelihoods with protecting species 
facing population decline. I look forward to the discussion today on proactive wildlife and habitat conservation solutions, and I thank you again for holding this hearing. And I thank my fellow senators for being with us today. Thank you, Senator Capito. And uh, as we, uh, we turn to, uh, to our, our witnesses, it's, uh, we're fortunate to have the sponsors, the prime sponsors of the legislation before us, Senator Martin Heinrich and, uh, from, from New Mexico, and Senator Roy Blunt, a senator from the state of, uh, of Missouri. And uh, we're delighted that you could be with us today. Thank you. And uh, uh, I think uh, Martin would like to hear from you first, so you just feel free to, to lead us off. Thank you. Chairman Carper. Ranking Member Capito, and distinguished members of this committee. Thank you for allowing me to share a few words about the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, or RAWA. Uh, I've been very proud to team up with my Republican colleague from Missouri, Senator Roy Blunt, on this bipartisan legislation. And I'm grateful for the support of the 16 Republican and 16 Democratic co-sponsors, including many members of this committee. As well as the support from the administration on this issue, including their testimony in support of the House version of this legislation. RAWA would establish a robust and reliable federal funding stream for collaborative, proactive, voluntary, on-the-ground conservation work. Consistent funding support has long been the missing piece in scaling up the type of recovery projects that have proven effective recovering wildlife and plant species to healthy levels. We're just coming off of elk season in New Mexico, and I'm happy to say that my freezer is full. Um, but elk were extinct in New Mexico just a century ago, and it is thanks to previous generations of conservationists, sportsmen and sportswomen, that I have the privilege of interacting with this amazing and beautiful animal. I'm indebted to people like Aldo Leopold, Elliot Barker, and federal, state, and tribal leaders whose actions led to the restoration of elk, mule deer, and pronghorn populations in my home state, and species like wild turkey and waterfowl and white-tailed white deer all across our nation. The abundance of many species that we hunt and fish today is the direct result of collaborative work inspired by those previous generations of Americans and financed by bedrock conservation laws like Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson. Yet despite the incredible successes of these programs, particularly with game species and sport fish, and the successes of the Endangered Species Act in preventing hundreds of species from going extinct, it's been clear for decades that too many species are still declining or even headed towards extinction. Without enough resources, our state and tribal wildlife agencies have been forced to pick and choose which species are worthy of their attention. And as a result, more than 12,000 species are currently identified as species of greatest conservation need. We have a once in a generation opportunity to change this paradigm and save thousands of species with a solution that matches the magnitude of the challenge. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act offers us a path forward. RAWA will fuel locally driven, science-based projects that will restore healthy fish and wildlife habitat and robust wildlife populations. These projects will create substantial economic benefits, including good paying jobs in rural communities. They will preserve outdoor recreation activities like hunting and fishing and wildlife viewing that support literally millions of additional jobs across our country. And they will save the federal government and the private sector tens of billions of dollars by saving species before they need emergency room measures just to survive. Before I finish, I wanna emphasize just how bipartisan this issue is. This committee has proven that we can still pass bipartisan conservation provisions within the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the American Conservation Enhancement Act, and the Water Resources Development Act. Last year, many of us here helped to pass the historic Great American Outdoors Act into law which is already helping us tackle the longstanding infrastructure backlog in our national parks and on our public lands. As one of the most important wildlife bills in decades, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act will allow us to make similar historic progress on species recovery and wildlife habitat. I'm proud of the coalition of sportsmen and sportswomen, conservationists, scientists, states, tribes, and wildlife advocates 
who are calling on Congress to pass RAWA. I have letters of support that I would like to submit for the record representing all 50 states, numerous tribes, and nearly 2,000 organizations across the country, such as the National Wildlife Federation, Ducks Unlimited, the Boone and Crockett Club, the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, NRDC, the Audubon Society, and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, without objection. I'll close by saying that I want my grandchildren to experience the same wonder I had as a child, catching leopard frogs, watching fireflies light up the dark, and I hope that we can pass on to them the full complement of our nat natural heritage, from bison to bumblebees, as well as traditions like hunting, fishing, and wildlife viewing. That's what this is all about. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very, very much for your testimony. Thanks for your passion uh, for this and, and your leadership, not just on this issue, but on so many others that we've worked on in recent years. Thank you. You said you, want, uh, you mentioned what you want for your grandchildren. My wife and I just want want grandchildren. So, <laughs> we'll worry about the rest later. <laughs> Senator Blunt, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Carper, and thank you and uh, Ranking Member uh, Capito for not only holding the hearing, but inviting uh, the two of us uh, to attend as you look at this piece of legislation. I also want to thank uh, my colleague, Senator Heinrich, who really has worked so hard to advance this and to be sure that we had a significant a group of bipartisan uh, co-sponsors, 32 bipartisan co-sponsors, and uh, Senator Heinrich has really worked hard to put this together. We've worked hard to find a pay for we believe works, and we've also worked to be sure that we had broad-based support from all 50 states, uh, including the conservation agencies in those states. Um, this legislation, as Martin has said, would be the most significant investment in wildlife conservation in a generation. Uh, it would fund proactive, voluntary conservation efforts to address really what is the nation's wildlife crisis. I also think it's a perfect partner to what we did in the last Congress as we look toward the future of restoring uh, America's great park system. Uh, enactment of this legislation into law would uh, boost our economy, create more outdoor recreation opportunities, provide regulatory certainty to landowners across the country uh, who otherwise are facing costly and burdensome impacts of potential threatened and endangered uh, species listing and, converse, uh, and conserve our national heritage for future generations. Uh, a significant part of the goal here is to work with these state agencies so the federal government never has to be involved uh, in an endangered species situation as they work hard to uh, do what they can to be sure that they never get into that situation. Uh, I'm also pleased to introduce one of the panel's witnesses today. Uh, Ms. Sarah Parker Pauley is testifying on behalf of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. This is a group she served as the organization's president of until just September of this year, she currently serves as the ninth director of the Missouri Department of Conservation, a position she's held uh, since November of 2016. Before that, she served as the director of the Missouri Department of Natural Resources from 2010 to 2016. Uh, she began, began her professional career as a policy out analyst in the Missouri Department of Conservation uh, in 1993. Uh, native of Columbia, Missouri, Sarah received both her law degree and her bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Missouri uh, and did postgraduate studies in Australia as a Rotary uh, Fellow. Just last month, uh, she and I did four joint events in Missouri highlighting uh, the recovery potential of this Recovering American Wildlife Act. Uh, this act establishes a new program, the Wildlife Conservation and Restoration Program, within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to promote voluntary conservation efforts to restore and protect at-risk, threatened, or endangered species. Uh, this program would provide approximately $1.3 billion annually uh, to states, territories, and tribes for activities related to proactive and collaborative habitat restoration efforts to increase wildlife populations or to prevent species from becoming listed on the Endangered Species Act. 
this bill would help fund critical conservation efforts in our state and our grasslands. It would help promote species like the Bob White quail, which were pretty numerous when I was growing up in Missouri, but have almost disappeared from uh, our landscape. Uh, Metal larks, the greater uh, prairie chickens, the restoration efforts that uh, Sarah and others have been uh, parts of, including everything from uh, restoring animals who at one time were very present in our state to uh, the sportive species like uh, wood ducks and other migratory animals that come through our state, animals and birds. Uh, this legislation would uh, boost Missouri's outdoor, outdoor recreation economy. Uh, currently, that economy supports 93,000 jobs in our state, contributes about $7.5 billion to the local economy, uh, and depends on healthy fish and wildlife populations. Uh, the bill would ensure more wildlife viewing opportunities, which directly contribute uh, to millions of jobs and billions of consumer revenue. Uh, in Missouri, based on the legislative proposal, we'd estimate that we'd receive about $22 million annually, uh, including the state matching funds. That compares to about a million dollars that the state receives right now. I haven't seen the entire list on this bill, uh, but normally on any distribution of money in the country, Missouri's right around 25. We're all right in the middle. So every state should look at that $22 million annual number, and you're going to be somewhere on either side of that, but obviously $22 million would make a lot more impact than the million dollars currently received from the federal government for these funds. Certainly look forward to working uh, with uh, the chairman, the ranking member, and, and my significant uh, co-sponsor here who's done so much work on this. Uh, this bill, as drafted, as Martin has already suggested, has broad bipartisan support in the Senate. Uh, it has a diverse group of stakeholders around the country, including the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, the National Wildlife Federation, and 1,500 or more uh, organizations representing state fish and wildlife uh, agencies, industry associations, and businesses. Uh, thank you again for holding this hearing, uh, for looking at this bill, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity all of the co-sponsors do to continue to work with this committee uh, as you think about what would really be an exciting addition to uh, what we do for our wildlife in the country. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you both very, very much. Thanks for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you about 1130 on the floor when we start voting. And uh, thanks again for your leadership. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to call our uh, second panel, if our second panel of witnesses would uh, take their seats. We'll <coughs> introduce you, and we'll get started. Well, I think of the uh, San Capitone, I've uh, welcomed each of you individually. We'll welcome you now collectively. And uh, we're delighted that you're able to, uh, to join us on uh, this uh, important day and for this important uh, hearing. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce uh, folks who frankly don't. One is Sarah. Parker Polly's already gotten an introduction from Senator Blunt. But uh, we're joined today by Dan Ash, President and CEO of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Dan, very nice to see you. We bring a world of experience to, to this hearing today. Colin O'Mara, President and CEO of National Wildlife Federation, former Secretary of the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control, and longtime friend for, of many of us in, in, uh, in Delaware. Sarah Parker Polly, who's already been introduced by Senator Blunt, uh, President of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And last but not least, Jonathan Wood, Vice President of Law and Policy for the Property and Environment Research Center. Dan, I'm going to ask you if you'll start us off with your testimony, and please proceed your testimony when you are, well, when you're ready. Good morning, uh, Chairman Carper and uh, committee members. It's good to be here again. 
and uh, on behalf of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and the Defenders of Wildlife and the National Wildlife Refuge Association, I just want to start by saying thank you for everything you do to protect wildlife and wild places. And I think especially the respect and dignity that you bring to these discussions. So thank you very much. Um, yesterday, I enjoyed reading Bob Dole's posthumous um, opinion piece in the Washington Post. And if you, if you didn't, if anybody hasn't seen it, I, I recommend it. Um, in it, he recalls in 1951, uh, newly elected to the Kansas House of Representatives, um, being asked by a reporter, what's on his agenda? And he said, well, I'm going to sit back and watch for a few days, and then I'm going to stand up for what I think is right. When I became U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service director, a former director and a good friend, Lynn Greenwald, gave me some similar advice. He said, Dan, find time to ponder. Lots of people are going to ask you to make decisions, and they're going to tell you that those decisions are urgent, and sometimes they will be. But most of the time, he said, it's going to be important for you to find some Find a, a, a time and some quiet and ponder. We're struggling against the planet's sixth mass extinction. It's driven by human existence, our economy, our ecology. It didn't begin yesterday. It won't be solved tomorrow. Even if you pass the Recovering America's Wildlife Act today. How you act and the decisions you make are going to set the stage and the tone. It's worth some time to sit back and ponder. Wildlife conservation is a shared endeavor. It's not individual. It's not state or tribal or federal. It requires commitment and funding at all of those levels. And my testimony, my written testimony, includes two illustrative and real-life examples, bald eagle and California condor. Here's another more recent one. In November of 2018, I got a letter from Eric Sutton, the executive director of the, Cal of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. They were encountering an unfolding disease, 95% fatal, destroying Florida's coral reef tract, and were asking for AZA members um, to use their facilities to help get ahead of it and rescue and hold healthy coral um, in refugia until the cause and a solution could be identified. And today, um, 20 of our members are holding thousands of Florida coral colonies, um, conservation giants like SeaWorld and Disney, but tiny titans like Colorado's Butterfly Pavilion. In the process, we've discovered that what's now called stony coral tissue loss disease isn't limited to Florida. It's pandemic across the Caribbean. It can't be solved by the state of Florida or the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico or sea worlds or butterfly pavilions. That's all necessary, but it's going to require much larger co cooperation, including federal agencies like NOAA and international and intergovernmental efforts. The same has been true with waterfowl. The same is true with monarch butterflies and little brown bats. Um, if our goal is to recover America's wildlife, we need to deploy all of our tools and fund all of our tools. And, and certainly don't leave some of your best tools with the least and most constrained access to funding. And you can do both. You can provide needed funding for tribal and state agencies and for the federal agencies that we know are going to be key ingredients in success. So thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have and help in any way as you hopefully look to find some time and some quiet and sit back and ponder and do what you think is right. Dan, thank you for that uh, timely uh, and wise uh, uh, testimony. Uh, Spend a fair amount of my time every day on the train going back and go down the northeast corridor, and I have I use that time to to ponder. Yeah. Uh, some people sleep on trains; I never do, yeah. but I do ponder a lot. And uh, there's plenty to, for us to ponder with respect to this. On a, a lighter note, Bob Joel, uh, many of us had the opportunity to serve. He served in 
World War II with my, my dad and my uncles and, and, and all, and was a real uh, hero, as, as you all know. And later married uh, Elizabeth, and uh, they, um, I remember uh, the, the day that he sat in a, a, a Senate hearing, not unlike this one, in order to introduce uh, his wife, who'd been nominated to be secretary in the administration of George Herbert Walker Bush. And he has, he has such a wonderful sense of humor. And he said, as you were sitting here, he said, alongside of his wife that he was introducing to his colleagues, and he began with uh, these words, uh, I regret that I have but one wife, <laughs> one wife to give for my country. <laughs> uh, he gave a lot, and uh, we miss him and uh, love him. And, and thinking of, uh, of Elizabeth today, a former colleague in the Senate, and uh, as, we, as we gather here. Um, I, uh, I'm going to now turn to uh, to Colin, if I, if I could. Colin, welcome. Uh, we're delighted that you joined us. Please proceed. Good. Senator Carper, Ranking Member Capito, members of the committee. Um, on behalf of the National Wildlife Federation, our 52 state and territorial affiliates, and our nearly 7 million members, thank you for the honor, for honor of testifying before you today. Um, first, let me congratulate the committee on the um, remarkable bipartisan infrastructure package and, and just thank each of you for the historic investments in clean water, habitat restoration, resilience, connectivity, environmental justice, clean energy. Um, and Senator Carper, thank you for making sure that investments in endangered species are part of the Build Back Better Act. Um, today, we have the opportunity to build upon this committee's incredible bipartisan legacy by passing the most significant wildlife legislation in half a century, the, Recover the bipartisan Recovering America's Wildlife Act. America's wildlife are in crisis. More than one-third of all wildlife, fish, and plant species face heightened risk of extinction due to immense and interwoven threats, increasingly fragmented and degraded habitat, invasive species, wildlife disease, landscapes ravaged by climate-fueled extreme weather, wildfires, droughts, flooding, and hurricanes. The Bipartisan Recovering America's Wildlife Act is a solution that matches the magnitude of the wildlife crisis. Simply put, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act will help recover the full diversity of wildlife by saving species before they decline to the point where they need emergency room measures and by accelerating the recovery of species are already endangered. This will prevent extinctions. It empowers states, territories, and tribes to recover the more than 12,000 species of greatest conservation need and to partner with the Fish and Wildlife Service to recover the 1,600 species already listed as threatened and endangered. They'll accomplish this by implementing the proactive and congressionally mandated the strategies in the congressionally mandated wildlife action plans. This will transform the way we recover species by shifting a model that today is largely constrained to regulation and litigation to one that unleashes unprecedented collaboration and innovation. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act does all of this without raising taxes or imposing new regulations. It leverages existing, undesignated environmental and natural resource fines and penalties and matches them with contributions from states, conservation partners, and other stakeholders. It supports well-paying local jobs in the outdoor economy while reducing regulatory uncertainty for businesses and reducing costs for taxpayers. And the legislation builds upon robust existing accountability safeguards to ensure that these funds are well spent. This bill also provides a historic and frankly long overdue investment in the essential, in the essential conservation work led by tribal nations. As Elvita Martinez, the president of the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society said, for tribes, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act is not just about an increase for fish and wildlife funding, it's base funding. It will be a game changer in the way tribes operate, manage, participate, and assert self-governance in fish and wildlife stewardship. This legislation has broad support across the full spectrum of conservation, the conservation community, fish and wildlife agencies, industry associations, and tribal nations. Nearly 2,000 organizations and entities have joined forces to support this critical legislation. Why? Because we all understand what happens if we don't act. Iconic and, un and unsung, hero unsung species alike will continue to vanish from the landscape and cost businesses and taxpayers will continue to escalate. Let me be clear, we are in the midst of a sixth mass extinction that is affecting all sizes and types of species. The growing number of scientific reports and field observations are a clarion call for action. Now fortunately, history shows us that by investing in collaboration and science-based restoration efforts, we can reverse this. We've accomplished amazing things for game species like deer and waterfowl and sportfish, and we've recovered the, through Pittman Robertson and Dingle Johnson. We've also recovered iconic endangered species like the bald eagle and the American alligator through the Endangered Species Act. Our nation does a remarkable job saving species when we put our mind to it and when we invest. I see it in my home state of Delaware, we worked with Senator Carper to recover Delmarva fox squirrels, red knots, and piping plovers. But the reality is that we have failed to invest in, at scale in the vast majority of species. Senator Heinrich and Senator Blunt's bill is the game changer that we need to ensure the full diversity of wildlife survives and thrives.
The Recovering America's Wildlife Act is bold and bipartisan. It's collaborative and proactive. It will have an immediate impact from the backcountry to backyards all across America. And let me just close with this. Inaction is the ally of extinction. 20 years ago, this very committee came so close <laughs> to dedicating resources to proactive, collaborative, and voluntary efforts to recover wildlife as part of the Conservation and Reinvestment Act, CARA. 20 years later, 406 additional species have been listed under the Endangered Species Act. 430 more are pro either proposed for listing, candidates for listing, petition for listing, and thousands of more have become species of greatest conservation need. The crisis is accelerating. The good news is that it's not too late to save America's Wildlife Act, but there's no time to waste. By passing the Recovering America's Wildlife Act and invest investing in this ounce of prevention, we can ensure that our children and grandchildren enjoy the full diversity of wildlife. Because the simple truth is that when we save wildlife, we save ourselves. Please support this legislation. Thank you. Uh, Colin, thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you for your service in Delaware as our secretary of the Department of Natural Resources for your great leadership uh, today and for your testimony today. Proud of you in the first day. Um, Sarah Parker, Polly, please proceed. Welcome. Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to address you in support of Senate Bill 2372, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. For the record, my name is Sarah Parker Polly, Director of the Missouri Department of Conservation and past president of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. I first want to thank my Senator Roy Blunt for co-sponsoring this legislation with Senator Martin Heinrich. Their dedication to this country's fish and wildlife is inspirational and sincerely appreciated. Mr. Chair, I sit before you today as an advocate for what we in Missouri hold dear. In fact, Missourians are so dedicated to conservation that in 1976, they were willing to tax themselves to guarantee they had healthy and abundant fish and wildlife and wild places to hike and fish and hunt and cherish. This dedicated funding has been a key to our conservation success in Missouri as it is allowed for long-term conservation planning and implementation. Take, for example, our prairie restoration work in Northwest Missouri. Over 99% of the original tall grass prairie is gone in our state, and many of the species that depend on diverse native grasslands are also imperiled. However, the Missouri Department of Conservation, landowners, and partners like Iowa DNR are voluntarily and collaboratively working to restore remnant prairies and reconstruct prairies an ecosystem that is critical to a plethora of species, including pollinators, which in turn are so critical to sustaining agriculture in the region. However, these projects do not happen in one or two years. To restore a prairie ecosystem takes decades of active habitat management and the staff and financial resources to make it happen. Simply put, conservation success does not happen overnight. It requires long-term planning and dedicated funding, which this act will provide to state agencies. Agencies with a proven track record of restoring species like wild turkey, deer, elk, and waterfowl. And though other states and tribes may not have the funding model of Missouri, they each have their own success stories to tell, like West Virginia and their work on the Cerulean Warbler, a small and beautiful neotropical migrant songbird that attracts bird watchers from across the country. By working to implement appropriate timber harvest strategies, they are creating and restoring habitat for this iconic bird species and providing economic benefits associated with the state's timber industry. But in Missouri, West Virginia, and elsewhere, the overall to-do list of restoring our wildlife far exceeds the available funding. Through the development of state fish and wildlife action plans, we know that there are over 12,000 species of greatest conservation need, which means they're species with low declining or rare populations, or they're facing threats and in need of conservation attention. These state plans serve as a blueprint for conserving our nation's fish and wildlife and preventing endangered species from being listed. Unfortunately, current funding levels only support an estimated 5% of the actions outlined in the plans, and the challenges are greater today than ever before. That means 95% of the work is simply not getting done because the funding does not exist. The Recovering America's Wildlife Act is the 21st century funding model we need now that will direct critical funding to state fish and wildlife agencies to proactively implement their science-driven wildlife action plans. 
It's important to note these state plans must be approved by the Fish and Wildlife Service as a condition of receiving funding through the state and tribal wildlife grants program. And this act would use the same accountability standards currently used for that program, which is arguably the most accountable federal conservation grant program in existence with five levels of accountability. This act actually adds a sixth level of accountability, requiring each state agency to provide a work plan and budget for implementing its wildlife action plan to the service, to this committee, and the House Committee on Natural Resources every three years. In 1937, President Franklin Roosevelt signed into law the Pittman-Robertson Act, which has been the monumental funding model for restoration and management of fish and wildlife spanning the last eight decades. Prior to the creation of the Pittman-Robertson Act, many game species were near the point of extinction, but because of state-led efforts and dedicated funding through the Pittman-Robertson Act, state fish and wildlife agencies were able to restore many of those game species. Henry David Thoreau noted that the meeting of two eternities, the past and the future, is precisely the present moment. I wonder, in the future, will our grandchildren be heralding our vision and leadership in this present moment like we talk about those who championed the cause in 1937? I certainly hope and believe that will be the case with the passage of Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your time today, and thank you for that, uh, that testimony. That was, that was great. Um, so batting cleanup, <laughs> last but not least. Thank you, Chairman Carper. Jonathan Wood, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito for inviting me to join the committee this morning as you consider the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Uh, as just introduced, my name is Jonathan Wood. I'm the Vice President of Law and Policy for the Property Environment Research Center, a conservation research institute based in Bozeman, Montana. For four decades, Perks Research has demonstrated the importance of property rights, incentives, and federalism to recovering wildlife. These values are critical to understanding RAWA and its context in broader conservation policy. As the Biden administration's America the Beautiful report recently observed, effective conservation depends on respecting private property rights and rewarding landowners for their voluntary conservation efforts. Frankly, private lands play an outsized role in the conservation of wildlife, including endangered and threatened species. Therefore, the key to recovering species is often to make them an asset for private landowners rather than a liability. Unfortunately, as Ranking Member Capito observed, we frequently get these incentives wrong. The Endangered Species Act can penalize landowners who accommodate listed species or conserve their habitats. These policies create perverse incentives that can undermine the goals of the statute and have resulted in only 3% of listed species recovering over the last half century. Partnering with landowners to solve real world challenges holds much greater promise. This year, PERC and the Greater Yellowstone Coalition partnered with ranchers outside of Yellowstone National Park on Montana's first elk occupancy agreement. Under this agreement, PERC and GYC paid for a fence to separate elk and cattle, thereby reducing disease risk and competition for forage. In exchange, the ranchers will manage nearly, nine, nearly 500 acres as winter elk habitat. Such win-win arrangements are how we will achieve our conservation goals for the long term. Pursuing conservation through state programs rather than a top-down federal approach can also increase innovation and accountability while reducing conflict. Given the very needs of wildlife, landowners, and communities, federalism's emphasis on local knowledge and flexibility is particularly valuable here. Moreover, state, enjoy, state agencies often enjoy better reputations and more trust among landowners than does the Fish and Wildlife Service. Unfortunately, although landowners highly value conservation, the intense regulatory conflicts that my friend Colin O'Meara uh, mentioned that have arisen between the service and landowners under the SA make the agency a less desirable conservation partner for many. This highlights the need to align ESA policies to support the goals of state conservation initiatives and to encourage voluntary conservation. PERC's 2018 report, The Road to Recovery, explains that one of the ESA's primary intended incentives for voluntary conservation and for state leadership was the distinction between how endangered species and threatened species are supposed to be regulated. Under the statute, federal regulation should relax as species recover and tighten as species decline which aligns the incentives of landowners with the interests of listed species. Likewise, states are encouraged to develop conservation programs in exchange for the power to effectively veto federal regulations governing take of threatened species. Unfortunately, these incentives have been thwarted for most of the ESA's history due to official wildlife service regulation known as the Blanket 4D rule. This regulation eliminates this distinction between endangered and threatened species regulation, and it also increases conflict over the listing process. Under the statute, management responsibility should shift to states and stages as species move from endangered to threatened to delisted. 
However, under the blanket rule, the stakes of a delisting are much higher. You go from full federal control to full con state control overnight. And this can encourage a sort of endless litigation like that we've seen for the recovered Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem Grizzly. In 2019, the agency repealed this blanket 4D rule, explaining that following the statute's approach could better incentivize recovery efforts, but it has recently indicated its intent to reverse that decision. Congress were to invest significant funds in state leadership on conservation initiatives. It should consider how to align ESA policies to ensure the success of those initiatives. For instance, it should consider whether, whether RAWA's wildlife conservation strategies entitle states to cooperative agreements under the Endangered Species Act. It should also consider the role of federal regulations for threatened species in encouraging conservation, rewarding state efforts, and providing a road to recovery and delisting. Finally, thinking creatively about how to fund conservation to reflect the full range of interests that value wildlife can make programs more sustainable. Too often, conservation is dependent on a single source, such as sportsmen. But hunters and anglers are not the only people that value wildlife or who impact wildlife. A 2019 PERC report, How We Pay to Play, shows that recreation-based fee programs can increase funding while promoting accountability. RAWA identifies several funding sources states can use for their matching requirements. A nudge to consider other creative ways to broaden the funding base may also be helpful. Thanks again for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for, uh, for your testimony. And again, again to, uh, to each of you who have spoken today. Given us a lot to ponder, uh, Mr. Ash, a lot to ponder. Uh, Senator Merkley has another press engagement. He's not going to be able to stay with us for long. And I'm happy to yield my time to him at this point. Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that greatly. And I wanted to turn to you, Mr. Ash. Um, you pointed out that a lot of the challenges we have with endangered species across state lines and, for that matter, across national uh, lines. And the amount of money, I believe, what, that we send to Fish and Wildlife for species protection is about $120 million a, a year. Uh, and um, obviously, this would create a lot more uh, funding. Um, but this says, and I've been listening to the testimony of everyone talking about kind of the, the 12,000 endangered species, a huge number of threatened species that haven't been listed as endangered because we don't have the, the money to cover them. Why, why does this bill have only one dollar out of every seven dedicated to endangered species or threatened species when everyone's talking about this is the big challenge, the biodiversity, uh, the enormous number of uh, affected species? Why are we dedicating only one dollar out of every seven in this bill, and should we dedicate more? Thank you, Senator Merkley. I, 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 obviously, based on my testimony, I think the answer to that is yes. I, I think that um, we've, we've heard a lot of reference to kind of reduce reliance on regulation. Well, uh, the most direct path to reducing regulation of endangered species is get them recovered and get them off, off of the endangered species list. I think um, when I was director, we delisted um, and uh, we recovered and delisted more species than all previous administrations combined. And that, that was four decades of work um, but what we did was we targeted our recovery money, our available recovery money, and said, okay, we have species that we can get them that last mile. We can get them off the endangered species list. So I think that the record is clear. If we invest in recovery, we'll get species off of the endangered species list. And so I do think this build um, requires a better balance between, between those responsibilities. And that's in all of our interests, including the wildlife. So, uh, Mr. O'Mara, uh, in, your, in your written testimony, you go through a number of states and say, hey, a lot of states take their federal grants and do a significant share above $1 out of every seven, above 15%, uh, to uh, threatened species, and that you, you anticipate that that will be the case here. Again, I'm going to ask a question. If we're really aimed at, at biodiversity, if we're really aimed at threatened species, uh, there's really two additional things we could do, and I just want your response to them. One is spend more than $1 out of seven on what is the mission of this bill, according to everyone's uh, testimony. Uh, the, uh, the second is to recognize, as Mr. Ash has pointed out, that so many of these issues transcend the states, and we so give so little funding, like $120 million a year, to fish and wildlife to take on in, uh, threatened issues, endangered uh, species. Uh, why don't we simultaneously say we're going to step up support uh, for the, the, the federal efforts when we're, when we're doing this bill? Uh, those, those two thoughts. 
every single dollar in this bill it goes towards the 12,000 species of greatest conservation need. So that's the universe you have to plan, not other species that are common, so you have to be in there. The 15% is for species, the 1,600 species that are already listed, so about 13% of the, of the total number. The, you know, and, and actually, I anticipate it's gonna be a lot higher. I mean, the 15%, I think, is, is a floor, not a ceiling. There's also a, another 10% of the money for innovation grants that's really intended to be focused on interstate collaboration. So for example, like, like your saline um, great, great Basin Bill, your saline lakes Great Basin Bill, or the monarch work you've been doing that kind of transcends boundaries, that money is intended for that, that collaboration. And I think a lot of that's gonna be spent on either candidate species that are close to being listed or species that are already listed that the folks wanna recover. You know, we would be in favor of additional funding for recovery. Um, I'm also worried that 20 years ago, this, this same point was one of the things that toppled the CARE effort. So if there's a political will to add money to the bill to do more on the federal side, we'd be absolutely supportive. I mean, there's no one that fights harder for funding and appropriations for the Fish and Wildlife Service than the National Wildlife Federation. Um, it's just been a sticking point for a lot of time for political reasons. And I wanna make sure we don't lose the ability to save the 12,000 species because we are fighting over one point in the, in the bigger context. So the way the bill is constructed, you're comfortable like in my home state, every time I go to the coast, I see a herd of, of 70 elk uh, hanging out, and it's our elk are very much recovered. Every time I go to rural Oregon, I see large flocks of, of turkeys, where I used to see if I saw one or two on a, on a remote road, I was astounded. And 20 years later, it's like, oh, there's a field with 70, 80 turkey in it. Uh, you're confident that this will not be a case that some states will say, hey, we can finally stock more lakes with more rainbow trout and we can double our already large uh, elk herds. I am because the, the species of greatest conservation need are really species that either are, are rare, declining, or have habitat threats. At this point, the turkeys and elk in Oregon are doing fine. <laughs> they wouldn't qualify. The Fish and Wildlife Service actually gets to review the plans and raise concerns. And so I, I mean, there's been this concern that the states will just spend on game species. The states are hungry to be able to work on the full diversity of wildlife, but the funding tools have been so focused on hunting and fishing species that we've been unable to do that. So I have confidence in the states to manage the money well. I also have confidence in the Fish and Wildlife Service to oversee that, that the dollars are spent well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Merkley. Uh, Senator Capito. Thank you. Let me just mention, after Senator Capito, Senator uh, Bozeman, I'll, uh, we'll turn to you. And Senator Cardin, uh, Senator Ernst was here, she's left. And then Senator Whitehouse. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Ms. Pauly, let me ask a question. This is a very general question, but in your opinion, what is the underlying problem that Recovering America's Wildlife Act is intending to fix, besides more money? <laughs> well, I think it's already been beautifully stated uh, by both of the sponsors and certainly by some of our other witnesses here today. We have, I think, pretty clearly identified the problem. We have 12,000 species of greatest conservation need that states have identified through their state wildlife action plans that was mandated by Congress. And so for 20 years, as you've heard, we had this mandate to uh, uh, inventory and develop these plans of these species that we know are in trouble or on their way. And the whole focus of Recovering America's Wildlife Act, the whole intention was to keep them out of the emergency room, to keep them off of the list. Mm -hmm. That has been the focus, that has been the intention. The states have done their part, uh, really without the funding. We have over the last 20 years uh, revised these plans where they are very science-driven, very specific plans with clear objectives on how to keep these species of greatest conservation need off the endangered species list. But the issue is funding. The issue is funding. We've been given this mandate. We've done our part to develop these plans. The funding hasn't come with it. And we have other great examples. Let's talk about waterfowl in this country. Since 1970, we've seen an increase in waterfowl populations by 56% because they had the authority. We, we've had the funding through NACA, through the federal duck stamp, through uh, farm bill programs, et cetera. So the authority was there, the funding was there, the partnerships there, and we've seen the success. At the mm -hmm. same time, grassland species, bird species declining by 53% because the funding wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So I would say we are, we're looking at uh, this window in time, and, and I'm all for pondering, but I think we pondered this issue personally long enough. Uh, we have the plans, the states are ready to go, and with every day, we've seen what's happened over 20, 20 years, 406 species now added to that list. 
Well, thank you. Um, I mean, obviously, resource constraints are difficult around the around the horn, and Fish and Wildlife has constraints too, as well. Um, and I think I know the answer to this question, but there has been an effort in, in to um, make uh, changes to this bill that would redirect a portion of the funding to the Fish and Wildlife Service. What kind of impacts do you think that would have on what you've just explained as the main, the main um, objective of the bill? The calculations of that 1.3, 1.4 with the tribal monies is really based upon what will it take for states to implement their state wildlife action plans. Mm -hmm. That's where this the, the 1.3 was devised, <clears throat> is what will it take for states to implement their plans. I have great respect for the Fish and Wildlife Service. I have great respect for the role that the Endangered Species Act plays. But the purpose of this legislation has always been to find the funding for states to implement their state wildlife action plans. All right, and as I said in my opening statement, I, I support that goal, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Wood, um, you talked about the, the blanket 4D rule and what kind of impacts that would have. Uh, can you elaborate on how rescinding that rule and returning to a more tailored approach, how, how can that benefit our private landowners in, in the quest of keeping, people, keeping species off of the list? Thank you for the question, at, at least in two ways. Uh, the first is it provides a direct incentive to landowners to care about whether species are recovering or declining. Under the blanket rule from the perspective of the landowner, the exact burdens fall on you regardless of whether a species is barely threatened or on the verge of extinction. And the way the statute was intended to work was regulations re are reduced as species recover and tighten should species decline. That aligns the incentives better. The other, as I mentioned in my testimony, is that it empowers states to take a greater lead on threatened species to deal with the situation that some of the other panelists mentioned where recovering species might take a long time. And the, the risk is that if species gets listed while the state is working on it, what does that do to upend a state strategy that otherwise could have worked? I mean, uh, Mr. Romero, if you were to diagnose where this um, uh, legislation falls short, or where you think it's going to, you already identified one of the issues, which would be redirecting money more to um, fish and wildlife could um, cause political problems with this concept. Do you have any other uh, comments on that, on where you think this legislation could run into political wins? I mean, I, I think on the, I mean, look, I mean, obviously there's concerns about um, fiscal impacts of anything right now. I think we don't do a good job scoring the cost of inaction. I mean, every time you list a species, it's about $20 million to the government every single time. And there's about, you know, 80 to $100 million of private sector impact. None of that scores under CBL. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and yet that's a cost that's real. I mean, it doesn't build in the baseline. It doesn't look over time. And so I, I think... Um, I just worry about having kind of the space to kind of make the argument that saying this pound of ounce, ounce, ounce of prevention is worth that pound of cure because the alternative, I mean, like imagine if, you know, if the monarch butterfly ends up listed, I mean, the impact on farms all across the country is massive, or if we had more collaborative tools, and Dan was doing a lot of this leadership work at, 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 when he was director, um, but it's always been under-resourced. Like, right. I'm convinced we can save most species through pro proactive collaborative work and save hundreds of billions of dollars of private sector cost. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, next is Senator Bozeman. It's your turn. <laughs> but he's uh, he's going to uh, uh, he's will be recognized immediately after you. Sure. Thanks. I don't want to do anything to cross center card. <laughs> None of us do. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank Senator Blunt and Heinrich for working so, so very hard on this bill to try and solve a, a difficult problem that's plagued us for years and for all of you all being here. Uh, Ms. Polly, in my home state of Arkansas, I found that farmers and ranchers are some of the best stewards of our land. Uh, that is why partnerships between the federal government, agriculture community are imperative to address species management and recovery. Personally, I believe the federal government should be incentivizing private landowners and making voluntary conservation efforts, those that are working in that regard. It appears that under the current structure of ESA, private landowners are not getting due credit for the time, the money, and labor they spend on voluntary conservation efforts. One of the reasons that I'm really pleased to be a co-sponsor of the Recovering America's Wildlife Act is because it would provide on the ground uh, actors such as conservation organizations, state authorities, and tribal governments with the resources they need to pursue collaborative 
conservation efforts in their regions. Can you talk a little bit, share your opinion on how will these additional resources help ease the tension felt by landowners when dealing with the Endangered Species Act that we currently have? Well, Senator, I so appreciate that question because much like Arkansas, Missouri is a state of 93% uh, <coughs> private land ownership. And so that private lands piece, we cannot accomplish conservation on the ground in Missouri without the help, the assistance, the support of our private landowners. Private land uh, really capacity and assistance is so important to us that we've created an entire branch in our agency uh, to add more boots on the ground, uh, additional cost share, cooperative positions with other organizations to make sure that we have the ability to reach those landowners that either want to do proactively conservation or are in need, uh, perhaps, of reasons of, of ESA. We have an example in Missouri. We have this little aquatic species called the Nyingua darter, and it needs really good water quality. And so we came alongside uh, these landowners uh, that um, farmed uh, in these watersheds that had the Nyingua darter. Uh, darter and help them through cost share and technical assistance with string bank uh, protection programs and um, other uh, soil health programs to ensure that we were meeting shared goals together. I think that's where RAWA is so critical because states have those local, those relationships with the landowners. There are neighbors. And um, you know those state-driven, local-driven relationships are absolutely critical. The collaborative nature of RAWA, the voluntary nature of RAWA is so critical moving forward. Conservation for the future has to be collaborative, and that's what we would do with these RAWA dollars. Okay. Very good. Um, as a nation, we've experienced the decline of six million hunting license purchases or purchasers in the last decade, Ms. Pauley. Uh, according to a recent study by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, an estimated 58.8% were $3.3 billion of conservation funds to state wildlife agencies come from hunting and fishing related activities, uh, either directly through the sale of uh, licenses, tags and stamps, or indirectly through the federal excise taxes on hunting, uh, recreational shooting, and angling equipment. It's clear that hunters are a significant force behind our nation's conservation efforts. In your opinion, what is driving the decline uh, in license purchases and what are the potential ramifications of the lost revenue to the wildlife conservation efforts? Senator, we could probably spend the rest of the time talking about uh, potential reasons behind the decline in hunting. And I'm gonna say it's everything from a society that's uh, moved away more from rural areas and is more urbanized. They've got more time commitments, so it's an issue of priority setting. Um, just the loss of that passing down of one generation from another. Um, many of us grew up hunting because we had grandparents or parents who do the same. And so much of that, I think, is just related to societal changes, et cetera. But you bring up an important point. Much of the conservation efforts uh, over the last uh, eight decades are because of hunters and anglers. You mentioned the percentage, very high percentage, coming either from license fees or from the excise taxes. So hunters and anglers have done their part. They have paved the way, and you know it's because of them that we have the, the conservation success stories. But the formula going forward has to be different. It has to right. be something picked up by all of us. Right. No, I, I agree, and that's the point. You know, we're going to have to backfill that, and and. Uh... Again, I think we've got a great opportunity to do that, and that's what this bill is all about, is providing that opportunity. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Cardin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank all of our witnesses for your commitment to our environment. Uh, there was an article in, in this morning's paper about the manatee in Florida, 15% uh, loss by starvation uh, this year. Uh, that's a... A climate change issue, we recognize that with seagrasses and, and, the, and their diet, but it's a reality of a, of an, uh, of a species that is certainly at risk. So um, the needs, we could mention so many different areas where additional resources are needed. So I want to get this bill to the finish line. Uh, 
But let me ask you a couple questions on this. This is a significant increase in funds, and the capacity to use those funds appropriately is something that we all have to be concerned about. I appreciate the accountability issues that you've already mentioned that are spelled out in this legislation. And I know your intent, and I trust what you're saying that this bill could be very well implemented in that way with the supervision of the Fish and Wildlife. But I've also seen what's happened uh, in the previous administration where we thought we gave pretty direct guidance through our legislation only to see the way it was implemented on the environmental side totally inconsistent with the bipartisan efforts here in the United States Congress. And that, that's not an attack on one party. It was on one administration I'm referring to at this point. So when I take a look at this bill and I see a great deal of discretion here, I'm a little bit concerned as to whether I need to be more direct in the legislation itself to make sure we don't run into an administration that looks at this as a way of providing resources for reasons not related to the purpose of this bill. How do I alleviate, how do you alleviate that concern? Mr. Ash, you've been involved in this. Thank you, Senator. Good morning. Barbara sends her best. Oh, you're already warming up to me. She I would see that. kill me if I didn't say that. <laughs> um, and um, uh, yeah, accountability is an important issue. And, and I would say again, for me, and realize my bias and perspective as a former federal agency um, career employee and political appointee, um, I think when you're talking about moving money off budget, um, which this bill does, um, it severely restricts accountability. And the annual appropriations process is the way that the US Congress um, constrains and, and, um, and manages accountability in a very direct and real way. And I think here, the big decision for you is when you move something off budget, you're saying it's it's more important than U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service funding. It's more important than National Park Service funding. It's more important than border control funding. It's more important uh, than anything else that has to compete in the annual appropriations process and demonstrate effectiveness. And so I think for you, as you think about accountability, that's really the threshold question that you have to reach. You're, you're, you're considering putting I accept that, that much money off budget. What I'm really asking, and, and maybe Mr. Wood, you could help me on this, is there more specifics that we should be directing in the legislation itself to protect against um, efforts made to politicize these funds, not for its intended purpose? Um, I think there are efforts you could do. So the um, Blue Ribbon Panel on which RAW was based focuses on proactive, voluntary state programs designed to protect the 12,000 species that the other panelists have mentioned. Um, I think that's clearly the idea behind the bill, but some of, the, some of that language could be incorporated to make that even more clear. But it, oh, I was going to say, if, 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 uh, this would be an ongoing process. If you have some specific suggestions, any one of the four of you, I would appreciate it. I want to get one other point in during my five minutes, and that is it's a significant increase, but it's also then going to be a higher burden on the match on the non-federal funds. Is, is Are we confident there's enough interest out there to, to meet the match at the higher levels? Yeah, and I'll defer to Sarah, but I mean, as I, I ran this, the Delaware agency, we talked to the Maryland agency. I mean, like the, the match resources, we do not believe are going to be a problem. There's a survey that Sarah can speak to of all 50 state agencies. I would love to speak to that. The Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies did do a survey of states. The states are very confident that they can meet these match requirements. We have a match report that we can provide to this committee that has a host of very innovative ideas. We are Robo ready, and I would hope that you would look through the six levels of accountability we're providing to these committee members too. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to get that on the record because once this bill is enacted, and a year or two later, when we get a request from our states to reduce the match, let's be clear that there is at least a commitment here that they are able to make the match that's in the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Cordon. Uh, next, uh, Senator uh, Whitehouse will be recognized and followed by Senator Padilla. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you, uh, Chairman, um, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here.
I was um, an early co-sponsor of this bill, and I'm happy to support it. But I do want to take this opportunity um, in front of Senator Padilla from a coastal state, myself from a coastal state, Senator Cardin from a coastal state, uh, our chairman from a coastal state, to point out what I see as a persistent bias in conservation and wildlife measures toward inland and upland projects versus coastal projects, towards freshwater projects versus saltwater projects. Um, those of you who are involved in the conservation community know that uh, the conservation community was busy calling me when we were trying to reauthorize Land and Water Conservation Fund, strengthen Land and Water Conservation Fund, make permanent Land and Water Conservation Fund. And I always said, I'm for this. But the money disproportionately goes to upland and inland uses. There's a huge discrepancy between what inland states get and what coastal states get if you adjust for population. And then when you go to the coastal states and you adjust for whether it's an inland and upland use as opposed to a coastal use, the bias gets even worse. And the conservation community always says to me, yeah, but you know, you be with us on this one and we'll remember, we'll stand by you, we understand that oceans and coasts are being shortchanged, we'll be there for you. Well, it's getting to be time for that day to come. Because the dangers to our coasts are very, very real. The environmental upheaval that is happening along our coasts is very, very real. Ask a fisherman. We've got refuges in Rhode Island, and they're all coastal. And they're all subject to sea level rise. Six to 10 feet anticipated right now for Rhode Island. Six to 10 feet, think about that. And you put a storm behind that, and you've added that much sea level rise, and it's piling up on the shore. It's not just six to 10 feet any longer. It's not just bathtub levels. Now it's blasting these refuges right off our coast. And I just want to send like the alarm signal that this has to change. And I hope that, I don't know how I can make that any clearer. And as we work towards getting this bill done, which I support, I think it's going to be really important for those of us from coastal states to get reassurance that this isn't just going to go to more inland, upland, and freshwater resources. I'm preparing a bill to change the name of the Land and Water Conservation Fund to the Upland and Freshwater Conservation Fund. Let's at least call it what it really is. And then we can address the problem of how we protect oceans and coasts in parallel. I don't know if that's going to get very far. I doubt it will. But it will for sure make the point that we've got to fix this. On behalf of coastal states everywhere, the days of the conservation community saying, don't worry, your day will come. Someday, in the dim and distant future, someday we'll show up and help you. This has to be that day. I've been here quite a while now, and I've been fobbed off and fobbed off and fobbed off over and over again. And, you know, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, but enough. There's a point where even a patient man's patience is exhausted. So, Senator. And if we could add, go ahead and feel free to respond. And also, well, you know, we've, there's been a lot of talk about the Endangered Species Act. You might want to talk a little bit about how applying this effectively will actually head off species being listed and would actually be quite a good thing with respect to the Endangered Species Act. So on the, on the point around um, funding, th this, this bill, um, actually with your team's help, addresses two of the longstanding inequities um, with some of the other funding programs in that um, it's land and water based in terms of like the, the land mass, but then also having the variable of listed species, which obviously are more coastal in their nature, right? It's places that are, have riparian corridors or issues. And so like Rhode Island, I mean, it's still, Rhode Island actually does better under this bill than you know, other, than, than land and water, for example, LWCF, for example. That's one of the reasons I'm co-sponsoring it. We also <laughs> appreciate that. Um, and, we, and we also like, I mean, I think I, my commitment to you is like, you know, I've taken a beating for supporting the RISE Act that has to get done this Congress. 
Because if we don't figure out the allocation issues for the revenues coming from the new, from offshore wind and everything else, we'll never get ahead of it. So I'm, I'm shoulder to shoulder with you on that. Um, we'd like to see that get done, you know, very close, very, very quickly. On the last point, um, we know that if we can save species before, I mean, it's just like emergency med med medicine. If we can, you know, do that preventative medicine before you're in the emergency room, it's cents on the dollars compared to trying to do it after you're already in arbitrary, in kind of triage mode. Um, and a lot of these best examples are actually stuff, stuff your, your group's done, Grover and folks over the years trying to save species before they're at that point. Um, and I think that's the whole premise of this whole model, that ounce of prevention is worth the pound of cure. Well, thank you, Chairman. I hope I've made my point. You have, you have, you haven't disappointed. Thank you. Um, Senator, we've been joined by Senator Lummis and uh, Senator Lummis. After you, uh, Senator Kelly. Senator Kelly has a special guest today. It's a Bring Your Brother to Work Day. I hope, I hope, I hope he'll introduce his, his brother, who's almost as distinguished as you, Mark. Uh, they, and uh, then we're going to turn to Senator Padilla. All right, Senator Lummis, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad we're having this hearing on RAWA because it gives us an opportunity to discuss one of the most important pieces of legislation in our committee's jurisdiction, the Endangered Species Act. From grizzlies, wolves, sage grouse, and more, this act impacts virtually every person who lives, works, or recreates in Wyoming. With only a two to 3% recovery rate for species listed under the act, um, the ESA's implementation is in need of a major overhaul. There are several pieces of legislation pending before our committee, including one I introduced this week that would bring much needed transparency and accountability to the act. And I hope it's something that we would consider going forward. My first question is for Mr. Wood. Uh, now, in your testimony, you observed and, and did a great job of expressing it, um, the importance of the constitutional principle of federalism. It's something I talk about almost every single time uh, we have a hearing in this committee in some form or fashion. So um, federalism is the unique separation uh, between the federal government and the states with regard to powers and responsibilities. And, and, and you've talked about it, uh, I think, in in very appropriate terms. So, Mr. Wood, can you speak to how Congress intended the Endangered Species Act to reinforce federalism when it comes to wildlife management? Absolutely, if you go back to the original debates, it's, it's really quite clear. Many of the most controversial parts of the Endangered Species Act were really looked at as a last line of defense to prevent extinctions. They weren't supposed to apply to every single listed species. And it was precisely to create the right incentives for states and private landowners to take the leadership. The things we've talked about doing under Wawa to, to conserve species before they're listed also work for species that are listed. If you get the incentives right, if landowners are encouraged to conserve and restore habitat and recover species, that's what you'll get. Uh, the problem is, unfortunately, too often under ESA regulations, we penalize those landowners. Their, their land is worth less because they accommodated rare species or they conserved habitat. Well, I, I, I'm so proud of Wyoming's uh, game and fish and its efforts in sage grouse. You all know, Dan Ash, you know, when you were director of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, what a great job Wyoming did on, uh, on sage grouse. So we have a longstanding commitment to recover species and, in fact, even have an, a wildlife trust fund uh, that we uh, use to leverage uh, opportunities to conserve species. Um, Mr. Chairman, a few weeks ago, um, I and several Senate colleagues wrote a letter to you and Subcommittee Chair Duckworth asking for a hearing on a bill that would delist the Yellowstone grizzly. Since writing that letter, the interagency grizzly bear study team made up of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Geological Survey, and others have revised the population numbers from about 750 grizzly bears to 1,070. So this is more evidence that the greater Yellowstone ecosystem grizzly has recovered and has been recovered for a long time. Uh, Mr. Wood and Ms. Parker, how important is prompt delisting under the ESA to maintain good relationships with states and landowners? 
I'll be quick to reserve some of the time. Um, it is absolutely critical. If you're a landowner, if you're a state, you've probably worked years or decades to get to that point. Delisting is the reward for you. And if we deny that to landowners, we discourage efforts to recover other species down the road. Well, I think you, you said it beautifully that that transparency and, and uh, just the, the dependability of what the act is intended to do so, so people can have uh, that assurance going forward. Um, but Senator, you, you, you mentioned the example, and I, I just have to use uh, this a little bit of time to mention that again, the value of the states and their boots on the ground is oftentimes when a species is um, potentially listed, states can go back in and do additional inventorying and monitoring. And in Missouri and many other states determined that there actually are uh, healthier populations, uh, more abundant populations than originally thought and actually keep species off of the list. And so again, the value of those additional boots on the ground and uh, the great role that the states play. Well, I, I remember going out and helping inventory Wyoming toad uh, at uh, some of our um, um, plains, high plains uh, uh, fishing areas. And uh, so you're right, boots on the ground make a difference. I want to thank you all for your uh, testimony. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thanks for those questions. Thanks for joining us uh, today. All right. I'm, I'm not sure if I got the right Kelly over here, but uh, sitting next to Senator Padilla is, I think it's Senator Mark Kelly, but I would well, be delighted if you would introduce your special guest. You know, Mr. Chairman, you never know. <laughs> you know we almost, we we've, all, we've all had experiences, I suspect, in school, years gone by, where we had, we're in a classroom at school with somebody who had identical twins. We did, we did that sister. on a space flight once. I went sure. into space <laughs> instead of him. You know, it was, it, it all worked out fine. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to, uh, begin by discussing the potential benefits of the recovery. Recovering America's Wildlife Act uh, provides the tribal communities. Um, and Mr. O'Mara, good seeing you again. Um, and this question's uh, for you. I, I want to start um, by asking for unanimous consent on a couple of letters. So we will need um, Mr. Chairman. Um, asking for unanimous consent to enter into the record a statement from Ms. Gloria Tom. Uh, she's the director of the Navajo Nation's Department of Fish and Wildlife, highlighting the benefits that this bill would provide to the Navajo Nation. Without objection. And I'd also like to ask for unanimous consent uh, on another letter uh, signed by more than 100 tribal nations urging Congress to support the passage of this bill. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Mara, Arizona is home to 22 tribes who all play a role in wildlife management on their tribal lands. Yet, many of the most, uh, many of the federal programs which fund wildlife conservation efforts are only allocated to states, not to tribes. Um, even when species needing conservation assistance are exclusively located on tribal land. So Mr. O'Mara, could you provide a brief overview of what current federal resources are available to tribes to help fund conservation efforts? And if enacted, how could RAWA help support tribal, tribal conservation efforts in ways that the existing federal programs cannot? So right now, uh, thank you, Senator Kelly. Um, tribes are responsible for the management of almost 140 million acres across the country. Um, and many are lands that are face disproportionate climate impacts, drought and, and other and extreme fire conditions. Yet the entire allocation um, through the kind of appropriations process is about a $6 million competitive grant program that they all have to compete for every single year. So there's no base funding. They have been systematically excluded from, from the you know, Pippin Robertson and Dingle Johnson and the other and the other major wildlife funding for years. It's one of the great injustices, frankly. And so this bill would have ninety-seven point five million dollars available every year through a non-competitive grant program that you know the, the tribes want to work out directly with BIA, um, and it, it's a game changer. 
and and frankly, the cultural knowledge, the the, the knowledge that they that that will bring to conservation, what we can learn from that, um, I think is going to be transformative. But I mean, I can't say it better than Gloria Tom's testimony or the testimony from the association, or the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society. So I would just encourage your member, your colleagues, to to read the testimony from Gloria because she's a she's amazing. Okay, I'll take a look at that, and I want to just kind of on a similar note here, talk a little bit about the metrics uh, that are used in RAWA uh, to determine how this funding is going to be allocated even out, out, outside of the uh, tribes. Um, every state has different uh, geography, different climate, different conservation needs, uh, and it's important that the federal formula that's used takes these differences into account. In Arizona, we have the third highest species diversity of any state in the country, yet because of the many different ecosystems within Arizona, and because we have a large share of federal, state, and tribal land, it's often difficult for our state to benefit from federal wildlife conservation programs which focus on specific types of ecosystem, species, and land management practices. So, uh, Mr. O'Mara, um, how does RAWA try to address the geographic diversity within and among states when providing funding for conservation assistance, and what factors does the bill use to determine the share of wildlife funding that each state and tribe will receive? So the, the traditional formula has been kind of population and land, which is just insufficient. It doesn't really, it doesn't really get it need. Mm -hmm. And so um, negotiations in the House actually had this idea of having an additional variable of, of the number of listed species that are either threatened, endangered, or, or candidate species um, as a proxy for kind of states that have particularly distressed ecosystems that need help. And so under that formula, Arizona does better because it has more species that are in trouble than other states than before. And uh, I think it, and this is where the iterative process in, in the House, I think, has been constructed because it's the first time a need variable, as opposed to just a size or people variable, which isn't necessarily the greatest proxy, has been has been used. And I, and I do think it's going to make a, a big difference um, to make sure that money winds up in the right places. When you add that to the accountability and to the, um, some of the other innovation grants from multi-state collaboration, um, all of a sudden a state like Arizona that has been disproportionately unsuccessful in some of those funding allocations, all of a sudden will do, do, do well. And, and then does that, a, that or a similar formula apply to the uh, non-competitive grant money that tribes can receive as well? Yeah, so so the, the tribes have requested that they be able to have those consultations with BIA and to figure out that system, but yes, I mean, need will be a, a portion, portion of that conversation. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for testifying today. For the record, I just note, uh, Senator Kelly, that uh, your brother who's sitting back over my right shoulder, his lips were moving when you were speaking. And I don't know, you guys have perfected this to quite an extent. Uh, we welcome uh, both of you today to the hearing. Thanks for those questions. Uh, and uh, Senator Padilla, Senator Padilla is next. Senator Padilla, I'm gonna ask you to hold the gap. I'm gonna send it right over to you. I'm gonna step out for a minute. I'll be right back, okay? So you can just, anything you wanna pass, get done, you know, as consent, you're, right. be careful. The, uh, shifting resources to California this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, glad to be here today. And before I jump into my questions, just to, a uh, quick commentary about uh, how thrilled I am. We're talking about wildlife conservation. Uh, the biodiversity crisis, uh, not just in California, but across the country and around the world is absolutely here. And wildlife managers and their partners are faced with the intertwined emergency of the climate crisis. Uh, I'm grateful we're able to have this conversation about how we can best conserve wildlife. Uh, and let me start with a, a California success story. Uh, California uh, has demonstrated how we can conserve species with one, uh, one example being the Southern Sea Otter Recovery Work, uh, which is led in part by the Monterey Bay Aquarium, world-renowned institution. Uh, but perhaps the proudest example uh, is the California condor, which is, uh, many of you know, was once at significant, significant risk. A uh, whole bunch of groups working together, starting with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a number of state agencies, the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, the Peregrine Fund, Oregon Zoo, Los Angeles Zoo, Ventana Wildlife Society, and several other prominent nonprofit partners provided critical genetic management, breeding, rearing, and releases into the wild to aid the recovery of this iconic California condor. 
uh, and I lay all that out just to show how, uh, how simple it's not, right? It is a process, it's complex. There's many elements to it and a role for so many to play. But from a population low of 22 birds, a handful of years ago, the species is now being downlisted with a population of more than 500 California condors, more than 300 of which are living in the wild. The assistance provided by our federal agencies helped make this recovery and uh, success story possible. And I'm supporting this bill today because I believe we need to increase funding for wildlife conservation uh, and because I understand that there's a shared responsibility among the many partners. Uh, question, Mr. Ash. Uh, how are AZA accredited aquariums and zoos situated to help advance species recovery programs in collaboration with state, federal, and tribal agencies as well as uh, other partners? Thank you, Senator. And the California condor is a kind of perfect example. And, and our members today, in my oral testimony, I spoke about a partnership that we've started with Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to help save Florida's um, reef track from, a, from an emerging disease. I think in, um, in Sarah's home state of Missouri, the St. Louis Zoo is working with the Missouri Department of uh, Conservation to on hellbender and American bearing beetle and other species. And unfortunately, I think the extinction crisis means that our members are going to be called on more often uh, to jump in. And I know in California, I've recently had um, conversations with Chuck Bonham and with Paul Souza, the regional director for the Fish and Wildlife Service, about how we can bring our members together um, to have specific conversations about how we can prepare uh, for, for these, um, what, what are almost certain to be emergency situations where species have to be taken into human care. And so our members are ready. Um, certainly funding provided through this bill would, will help um, because space and infrastructure and, and, hu and, hu and human capacity are what's gonna be important to, to duplicate the, the successes we've seen like um, California condor. Thank you. And uh, just to, to follow up on that, uh, what are some of the ways in which federal partners, federal government, number of departments and agencies can support the work of aquariums and zoos? Are there, uh, um, certainly there's always a desire for additional resources and funding, but other strategies that uh, you'd like for this committee to consider? And, and I invite you to think both you know, the measure before us, uh, but also just broadly an ongoing relationship and uh, partnership. Of course, my main, my main point today is a, is a better balance and a better reflection of the kind of, of the interdependence um, in conservation and that the federal role is absolutely essential. The condor success wouldn't have happened if the Fish and Wildlife Service didn't have the funding um, to support organizations like the Los Angeles Zoo and the Peregrine Fund. And so that federal funding is absolutely essential. Um, I think looking forward, I think there needs to be um, some specific recognition and infrastructure support for our members, like the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They're kind of holding southern sea otters. I also uh, quite honestly think there needs to be some kind of um, relaxation of certain regulation, like uh, the southern sea otter. Monterey Bay Aquarium is put in the position of having to euthanize um, young sea otters because they don't have the space for them. Um, so they're rescued, but they don't have the ability to care for them because they don't have the space. Mm -hmm. um, they can't be exported um, because of restrictions in the Marine Mammal Protection Act. But um, we, we have mem par participating zoos in Europe and, um, and Australia and other places that could, that would be anxious to, to hold those animals if we could export them. And so I think um, to some extent, looking at existing regulations and how we might be able to change them, I think is important. Look forward to following up with you on that. And Mr. Chairman, I know my time is uh, about up, but I do want to ask just uh, one more question. Uh, our colleague, uh, Senator Kelly, uh, brought up uh, unique dynamics and concerns as it pertains to uh, tribal governments. A uh, big priority of mine is more than 100 federally recognized tribes in California alone. Uh, and want to make sure that uh, the federal government upholds its trust responsibility and respects tribal sovereignty. Uh, 
and governance. In many contexts, it means ensuring that tribal governments don't have to go through the states to compete for funding, as Senator Kelly uh, laid out, but uh, instead are able to receive or access funds directly from the federal government. Uh, we know that in California, a number of examples, tribal nations carry out important conservation work, leveraging their historical and cultural knowledge. Uh, I commend the authors of the bill uh, bef that's before us today for understanding that unique and important role uh, that tribes play in natural resource preservation and providing dedicated funding for tribal wildlife conservation. I did, uh, for the record, want to ask Mr. Omara, uh, your written testimony includes a quote calling the bill a game changer for tribes. So uh, can you spend a minute just talking about the importance of this bill for tribal sovereignty uh, and respect. Yeah, no, thank you, Senator Padilla, and thank you for your le leadership on this and being one of the earliest co-sponsors. Um, you know, tribes, as you said perfectly, are just the historical knowledge, the cultural knowledge, the scientific knowledge um, is is incredible. And the fact that that has not been resourced other than a small $6 million you know, competitive grant program um, is one of the greatest failings of wildlife recovery in this country. And, you know, I think the, the $97 million annually is a, is, a, is a great start. It begins to address the historical inequities. But when you look at the landscapes and you look at um, also where most of the tribal nation lands are. I mean, they are lands that are facing disproportionate impacts from drought and fire and other concerns. And so the species, um, many of which are uniquely um, on tribal lands, um, to have, have the ability to actually have resources for the first time for them to engage in conservation on their own, in, you know, on their own lands, but also in partnership, is transformative. And so I, I appreciate your compliment that it's that that the respecting the sovereignty is so important. I will say that one of the reasons I think that the, it makes sense, and one of the reasons we had a letter from a hundred different tribes, is that the tribes actually wrote a big part of that section. Um, it wasn't you know kind of folks assuming, but again having those authentic consultations. And and I cannot say enough about the Native American Fish and Wildlife Society, their leadership, and having conversations across all different jurisdictions, all with all different sovereign nations, um, has been spectacular. So their their leadership is just just it's amazing. Wonderful. Well, definitely a, a solid foundation to build on and look forward to uh, supporting this measure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, th thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for those questions. And thank you for uh, taking a gavel for a few minutes and giving me a break. Thanks. I, uh, I have uh, about three or four uh, more questions I want to ask. We're going to finish up around 1 o'clock. And uh, no, it won't take quite that long. But uh, I'm going to start off with Dan Ash and talk a little bit about the importance of the federal recovery plan. Um, considering the, uh, the collaboration that's necessary across uh, not just state or local levels, but across all levels of, of government, would you elaborate on the uh, on-the-ground implications, on the on-the-ground implications of providing sufficient resources only to states and tribes uh, and not to federal agencies? Particularly, let me just say, well, in, in particular, how might lack of funding for recovery planning impact states' efforts to uh, recover threatened and endangered wildlife uh, under the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Sure, I think um, you know reference was made earlier several times to waterfowl conservation, and I think that's a prime example of where um, we have achieved tremendous success in conservation of waterfowl. Um, it's been led by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and um, it's been driven by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, and, um, and so I think that's a, that's a type of example. When we're talking about monarch butterfly conservation, you can't conserve monarch butterflies from, from Iowa or North Dakota or Minnesota. It requires cooperation with um, Canada and Mexico in particular, because if we don't protect the wintering grounds and reserves in Mexico, we all of the conservation effort in the United States is meaningless. Um, and, and so you, it's absolutely essential to have, um, to have the, a, a, a strong, effective capacity within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, Senator Whitehouse mentioned the coast and, the, and NOAA fisheries um, if we're going to drive um, ocean, conserv ocean and coastal conservation. And, and so that leadership is essential. And I would say we, we, we're, we're talking a lot about you know, proactive, voluntary, incentive-based conservation. Um, Senator Cardin opened up talking about manatee. Um, the issues around conservation of manatee 
uh, are, are full of conflict um, because it's going to involve issues of runoff and what's driving the, the loss of seagrass beds in, in Florida. And so, um, and so the, um, and states have their own politics and, and the presence of federal agencies often, in my experience, um, is a benefit to our state agencies because the Fish and Wildlife Service becomes the heat shield on some of these really significant political issues that are difficult for them to deal with in wildlife conservation. And so that, that role is absolutely essential. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much for that response. I'm told that the, uh, the Senate's going to be, if we're not already voting, they're going to start voting very soon. So I thank you for that response. I'm going to ask our uh, witnesses not, uh, not to, uh, to linger too long in your responses, but just cut right to the chase. Thank you. All right, Colin, please. With your exception, Colin. I always talk quick, so <laughs> I'll try it's, to be brief. I'll try to be brief. The fastest talker, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I have ever met. When he first, I first came to Delaware to become our secretary of the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. I think he might have been 30 years old. And <laughs> he was a fast talker, then he slowed down a little bit since. Go ahead, Colin. Um, I mean, the, the success. Uh, no, no, let me ask a question. Sure. Uh, consultation is, maybe you're reading my mind, who knows. <laughs> consultation is a process that federal agencies uh, undertake uh, in order to ensure that federal actions, like infrastructure development, for example, uh, will not harm threatened and endangered species. We actually had some great provisions in the infrastructure bill, as you know, to uh, protect them and uh, in, the, in their habitat. Uh, if uh, federal ag uh, actions uh, may harm and imperil species, agencies use, as you know, the consultation process to minimize, try to mitigate uh, that that harm. Question would be: Do you believe that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service currently? receive sufficient funding to undertake these consultative activities, uh, which are critical to the survival of imperiled wildlife. And would you elaborate on the importance of ensuring that Fish and Wildlife Service uh, receives sufficient resources for these activities, please? Um, I mean, in, in Delaware, when we were dealing with the Recovery Act money or the Sandy uh, supplemental resources that you, you provided, um, the partnership with Wendy Weber and the Fish and Wildlife Service was essential. I mean, to get those projects done, the restoration of Mississippian Harbor, the improvements in, in so many places. Um, and so, no, I, I, there, there's vastly insufficient resources for consultation. Um, I was disappointed. Um, I was excited, both in your, your work and the House work, and trying to have more resources in the Build Back Better Act. Um, I'm grateful for the resources you were able to put in the bipartisan infrastructure package. Um, but it does concern me that we were not, we're not going to have sufficient resources that could be an impediment to the infrastructure work we want to do. Um, I think when it relates to recovery, that the you know having having resources as long as it doesn't upend the balance of the bill. I mean, I also worry that this the, the delay is 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 deadly. Um, and so, trying to figure out a way to do that in a bipartisan way is going to be important. But I mean, from my experience as secretary, the um, the benefits of having that partnership were incredibly incredibly important. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for that response. Let me see. Dan, I'm, I'm going to come back to you for another question, and uh, that is uh, Partners for Fish and, and Wildlife. It was, uh, the Partners uh, for Fish and Wildlife program, which this committee successfully reauthorized, I think about two years ago in 2019, is one of the most popular federal programs for working with landowners to conserve wildlife. And over the last five years in our state, in, uh, in Delaware, this program has delivered something like 26, 27 uh, uh, habitat restoration projects on over 600 acres. Uh, in some states, that might not sound like a lot of land, but in Delaware, that's a lot of land. Uh, for every dollar the Fish and Wildlife Service invested in, non-federal partners contribute approximately $7.50. Impressive ratio. Uh, these projects have uh, supported species like the American eel, the woodland box turtle, uh, wood frog, and many migratory songbirds. Despite the success of this program and its uh, and its ability to leverage non-federal funding. There's substantial uh, unmet financial need for it. So having worked to administer this program as Director of Fish and Wildlife Service, would you elaborate based on your experience uh, on the importance of this program and others like it to work with private landowners to conserve wildlife? Thank you, Senator. And a, a lot has been said here today about um, incentive-based conservation and cooperative conservation. And, and I would say the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program in the Fish and Wildlife Service is, um, is a model for that. And so I you know, certainly applaud state colleagues for the, their work that they do, but it's not just a province of, of state and tribal agencies. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service was a pioneer with their 
uh, Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program and working with private landowners um, on incentive and voluntary based conservation and, and working with and through the Natural Resource Conservation Service on the Working Lands for Wildlife Program. And, and our, our Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program has been a principal agent there in building a relationship with NRCS that then builds a relationship with private landowners. And so, um, so that's not a province of state or federal or tribal or local government. It's a bedrock principle in conservation, and I think the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program in the Fish and Wildlife Service embodies that and deserves equal access to funding to support it. All right, thank you. I'm gonna, I don't mean to pick on uh, Colin Romero, but I'm going to ask him maybe one more comment. Uh, the, uh, as, uh, as you may recall, when I was privileged to serve as uh, governor for, for our state, uh, we had uh, eight balanced budgets in a row. I think before me, the governors before me had uh, significant success in terms of fiscal management, the ones that succeeded me as, as well. Um, that's something we take uh, great uh, pride in. Uh, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act identifies uh, unobligated uh, environmental penalties uh, as its funding source. This appears to include some super fun cleanup recovery dollars and criminal fees. Because these dollars currently go to the Treasury funding source may not effectively uh, pay for this legislation. Uh, at least that's a concern that we've heard. Uh, your testimony also states that this funding source will not draw from funding committed to other important funding programs. However, this funding source does seem to allocate penalties derived from Superfund disasters for wildlife protection. And that's a concern, especially because those Superfund fees reimburse the government for cleanups that may have already occurred where a third party was found liable. In addition, there are sufficient un, uh, unmet uh, funding needs uh, related to the Superfund cleanups. Question, uh, have the proponents of the Recovering America's Wildlife Act thought about any funding source that would fully pay for the legislation and that might address this policy concern that I've just touched upon? And would you uh, commit to working with us on, on this aspect? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Um, the intent is to not touch any funds that are directed for any current purpose. So if there's improvements to the language, we'd like to, to work with you on that. Um, I have been searching, and I think we have been searching for an elusive <laughs> kind of stable pay for that both sides of the dais can agree on for four years. Um, and it has been incredibly difficult. And so if there's an idea that <laughs> you and your, your team have, um, I think this is an idea that um, Senator Blunt, uh, with his leadership, um, saw as something that had a nexus, um, had, a, had a point, and if you look over the historical um, amount going into these, going into the Treasury um, over the last 10 years, if you, if you kind of define it broadly, it well more than covers the 10-year the score, um, but it is uneven year to year, and it's, it's unpredictable in some ways, but the 10-year the average is good. Um, I, I just, I, what I want to make sure is that this doesn't become the reason that the bill doesn't pass, because as I said in my testimony, it's just the, the inaction is the greatest ally of extinction right now, and so if there's a better mousetrap, we'd love to discuss. All right, thank you. Um, Dan, would, would you just, uh, as a follow-up to the quest, uh, question I just asked uh, 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 Secretary Amara, but uh, do you have any concerns about the funding source that's identified in RAWA? Do you have any concerns? Um, I don't, um, my, my, my concern is, I, it's, a, it's a little bit, I think I have the same concern that you do. As I look at it, I, I, I immediately thought about the Deepwater Horizon settlement and $5.5 billion um, in Clean Water Act penalties um, went to restoration. Um, they're not directed to go there by law. They don't, they're not, they're normally deposited in the treasury and they were directed through the settlement agreement um, to go to restoration. Um, and so when I, when I read this, my immediate concern was, all right, is that gonna short circuit that process and require these funds to be deposited, uh, you know, to, to support this bill. And so my, my recommendation would be talk to somebody at the Department of Justice, maybe somebody like John Cruden, the former um, uh, uh, Associate uh, Attorney General for Environment and Natural Resources who, who worked on that settlement. And so get, get some advice from those people. All right, thank you. Uh, I, I, I don't have a specific question for either Ms. Polly or Mr. Wood, but take each of you maybe a minute apiece and just uh, uh, just a quick closing thought that you'd like to share with us before we, uh, I go, uh, go vote. Uh, Ms. Polly, one minute. Thank you so much, uh, um, Senator. And I think I want to hit just uh, some of the, the points and the questions that have come up uh, more recently, and it, it seems a little bit to, that we're pitting the states against the, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and I hope that that isn't the case. 
We do so much amazing work with our federal partners. Uh, in the Midwest, we have such a healthy relationship where we work very collaboratively with the Fish and Wildlife Service on shared conservation priorities. So I wanna make sure that uh, the members of this committee understand just how important that relationship is with the Fish and Wildlife Service. But again, I will hit the point that from the Blue Ribbon Panel and their focus to the development of this legislation, the intent of this legislation has been to at long last provide critically important funding to state fish and wildlife agencies to actually and at long last implement those state wildlife action plans. That to date has been the focus of this legislation. So I just wanna make sure that we are all clear that conservation takes all of us. Those federal partners are critically important. The last point I would make is just as a director of a fish and wildlife agency, such a key piece of this legislation is the long-term dedicated funding nature of this so that we can actually make decisions of a long-term nature. We talked about in the beginning, conservation doesn't happen overnight. There's no easy decisions. By the time they get to me, just like you, there's no easy decisions. It takes the long view and that dedicated, sustainable funding source is so critical to make these key management decisions to be able to provide additional staffing capacity. So I would call upon the committee to keep that into consideration. And thank you so much for your time. No, no, and thank you for yours and for your leadership uh, over these years. Uh, Mr. Wood, last uh, so try to hold it to about a minute if you could. Absolutely. Uh, I want to echo my, my thanks for inviting me and, and pick up on that similar point. Um, I think there are really important reasons to focus conservation work through states rather than the federal government. Um, because states have that flexibility, they have buy-in. Um, but what point we haven't emphasized so much that I go into in my written testimony is landowners are more comfortable working with states because most of their interactions with the Fish and Wildlife Service begin with regulation or a listing. Before you get to the how can we collaborate, that, that can alienate landowners. So you're more likely to get buy-in from landowners in actual on-the-ground conservation if it starts in that dialogue with the states of how can we solve problems rather than how can we impose regulations to try to control what you might do. Thank you, uh, thank you very, very much for taking uh, this time for preparing and for joining us and responding to, uh, to, to, to our questions. I just um, mentioned something was, uh, that had been shared with us. We know we hear from folks all over the country, folks with uh, different kinds of uh, opinions on uh, these uh, issues and, and all, but someone has raised the issue and I'll just uh, just share what, what they've brought to us and said, it, said, while some states have had to dramatically tighten their belts and cut spending to address uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, we've also found that overall the impact of COVID-19 on state budgets uh, were not as severe as we'd feared earlier in the crisis. And went on to say, uh, in fact, according to the National Association of State Budget Officers, fiscal survey of states published in spring of this year State by total budget uh, levels, balance, to total balance levels. Um, in other words, that's their state rainy day funds, add that to their general funds and uh, year ending uh, balances. Reached uh, $126 billion in fiscal 2021, the year that I think for most states ended on June 30th. Uh, this is up from about $122 billion before the pandemic and they're actually in better shape fiscally than after they, than they were going into the pandemic, which was a surprise to me. Uh, by contrast, federal deficits have increased, as you know, as the federal government has jumped in and injected um, badly needed COVID relief and stimulus funds into the economy. In fact, in 2021, uh, the uh, in fact in 20, uh, 2019, the uh, I'm told that the federal deficit for that year was 992 billion dollars. 992 billion dollars in 2019, uh, and uh, in uh, fiscal. 2021, the federal deficit, uh, I guess it's the immediate past year that ended on September 30th. Federal government ran a deficit of $2.77 trillion, uh, due in large part to try to address the pandemic and to really to help state and local governments meet, to meet their responsibilities. The person who's raising these uh, these concerns, so the, the, the states, in terms of their fiscal positions, not that bad right now. Uh, the federal government is running a deficit uh, in the current year of almost $3 trillion, which is just, except for wartime, it's just unheard of. And the, uh, the question is, um, and this is shared responsibility, this is team sport. And uh, we need states, uh, we need uh, 
federal government, we need other uh, shareholders, stakeholders. And, uh, but I just would have us, and whoever, the person who shared these co com comments with me, just said that we need to keep that in, keep that in mind. The federal government has the ability to, not to print money, but to uh, uh, really spend until the cows come home. And that's what we're doing to try to get, their, our, our, get the COVID behind us in our rearview mirror. Uh, but uh, someday there'll, there's going to be a time when we're going to have to be f fiscally responsible and to look at the, um, uh, the federalism, the sharing of responsibilities with the states, and to make sure that, that our uh, contributions are, are appropriate both at the federal level, state and local level, and with respect to other soft sources too. So I'm going to just close with, with that. It's been a great hearing. Yeah, this has been a great hearing, and I applaud the, uh, the leadership provided for us by Senators Heinrich and Blunt and those who have joined them in this cause. Uh, I uh, uh, would say just in closing, I think I... Uh, Do I have a closing statement? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just a uh, quick, uh, quick closing statement. Uh, as I said earlier, the, the committee has a great track record of enacting bipartisan conservation legislation. You all have been a part of that. Uh, and at a time when the future of many uh, species on our planet is uncertain, we need to act. We know that. Uh, right now, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act is, I think, a good piece of legislation. Obviously, uh, you do, too. And I think we can make it great. And uh, I look forward to working with, uh, with members of this committee, with our other colleagues, certainly with the sponsors of the legislation. And, uh, and uh, with our conservation partners just to, to do that, make it great. Before uh, we adjourn, a little bit of housekeeping. And uh, I want to take, I'd like to ask a unanimous consent to some, I'd like to, love to ask unanimous consent why I'm the only one here. It's one of my favorite things. But, uh, I want to ask a unanimous consent to submit for the record a variety of materials that include letters from stakeholders and other materials that relate to today's uh, uh, hearing. Uh, senators will be allowed to uh, submit uh, questions for the record through the close of business on uh, Wednesday, December 22nd, and we'll compile those, uh, those questions, send them to our witnesses, ask for our uh, witnesses to reply by Christmas Day. Not really. Uh, we're going to ask you to res respond by Wednesday, January the 5th. And with that, uh, we wish you all, you and your families, happy holidays, and uh, thank you for all that you're doing to protect God's creations on this planet. With that, our hearing is adjourned. Thank you.